Anybody have anything they want to talk about in the meantime? All right, how about um, these emails that I've been getting from Recess? I guess for um, foreclosure listings. I think that's the name of the company. Um, do you know anything about them? R-E-S-A-A-S. -A -A they sell a premium service. They're giving a free trial, they say, um, to get um, foreclosure leads from the bank. Listing leads. I'm not familiar with, I'm not familiar with them. I haven't heard of them. Um, I don't know if I've been getting those emails or not, but uh, what do you guys think about the foreclosure market? What do you think is going to happen with it? Probably going to increase. Short sales, anyway. For sure, and that's that's something we can talk about very much. It's just that people can't pay the mortgage. Right. So we've talked a little bit uh, in recent weeks about short sales, um, and this this the the pandemic has caused a lot of people obviously to lose their jobs or be furloughed or or whatever and and that's um, a lot of people and, and tom can speak to this a little bit because i'm sure he knows a lot more about this forbearance and whatnot that people have been doing and there are a lot of people who can't make their mortgage and a lot of people who when this forbearance runs out they're going to owe a bunch of money and they but the difference between right now and then in 2009 2010 is that there most people aren't upside down in their house so, so most people are, those people are just going to need to sell, right? And they're going to need to sell quickly and they're going to need to sell for enough to cover their mortgage plus all of their closing costs, including commission and everything else. And then whatever they can walk out of there with, with money in their pocket. So be prepared for those kinds of listings and those people are going to want to do it. And that's the, you're, you're, you will, um, you will need some kind of pitch for that for for selling someone's house and getting them the money out of it. And you need to find out how to identify and, and approach people who might be in that situation right before they need, right before they figure out that's the situation they're in. Okay. So um, it's a bit of a touchy thing. That's a, we talked about this uh, a while ago. We talked about pre foreclosures. It's a touchy thing to approach people about, right? They're on edge. They don't have any money. They can't meet their bills. They know their house is worth more than they have in it. What am I going to do next, um, et cetera? And we'll have we'll have Tom talk a little bit about forbearance as well. Um, but uh, it's uh, you, you have does that kind of answer? Uh, that that's that's what's going to happen with the with the foreclosure market, I think, because there's not going to be a lot of short sales. Not a lot of people are upside down. Yeah. Right. No, I mean more specifically, I was talking about this exact company that's been emailing me. Um, asking if I want to join their service to get leads. Um, they say they're directly from the banks, but I guess they're the middleman um, that will be having foreclosure listings and then be the listing agent um, for that foreclosure home. Um, well, so I sure don't know if anybody's worked with them. Uh, well, I'll, I'll leave that out there if anybody has any input on that, but I'm, I'm all for taking those free trials and trying to see what you can get out of stuff. Um, uh, as you guys know, I shared with you uh, about a month ago that I took the uh, REO Rockstar class during the pandemic um, when I had some free time. I took that, um, and uh, there, there's a lot of valuable stuff you can learn there, and it wasn't just teaching you how to do it, but it was also the, he, the, the gentleman that runs it shared some contact information for the, the, big, uh, the big companies that, uh, that dispose of the, of the assets. So um, that was a cool thing to do. Um, I think it was 169 bucks or something like that, but it was, uh, you know, that's a system and they still email me all the time and they're, you know, giving updates and tips and ways to get leads on them and ways to get in with the, uh, not the lenders, but the disposal companies. So um, I, I would recommend, I, I recommend trying that kind of stuff and seeing if it works, especially if you get a free trial. Um, all right, guys. Ryan, cool. I'm yes, sorry. Classic REO Rockstar? REO Rockstars. Yeah, if you Google that, it'll come up. Okay, I thank you. Michael something. Okay. Uh, have it with me. Um, all right, guys. Well, it is uh, 1036. So I would like to, uh, uh, if you, as you guys know, and as you saw in my email, I've been getting a lot of questions from you guys. I've seen a lot of talk on, on social media and stuff about these 
great rates that people are saying that they're getting and, and all of this stuff. And, and why is my client not getting that? And then the clients are talking to you, referring them to the lenders and the lenders are talking to them and the, the clients are having unrealistic expectations, both from the realtor and from what they're hearing on the street about the kind of rates that they're going to get. Um, and also a bunch of you guys have let me know, and I've seen it myself where um, closings are happening in the week and then you get notified that underwriting is behind and they're going to need an extension. Um, have you guys, anybody hear anything about this? Okay. So um, I thought it would be a good idea to bring in um, a lender. Um, he's actually, uh, for full, full disclosure, he's also my brother-in-law um, and he's a great guy, but he's with Waterstone Mortgage. He's sponsored, some of you guys have met him at events that he sponsors. Um, his name is Tom Weinerd and Tom will be here to answer your questions. I, I actually had uh, planned on an inspector coming in this morning. Um, it canceled. I called Tom this morning and Tom was willing to come in. He didn't prepare anything for you guys, but he's willing to come in and, and answer questions and, and talk to you guys. So um, please welcome Tom Weidert and uh, please hammer him with any questions that you guys have. He can take it. Good morning. Good morning. Hey. Uh, if you want, I can just kind of give you guys an overview of what's going on in the market. And if you have questions, happy to answer them. Um, basically, the market's really good right now. And, and most of that has to do with where rates are. They are very low. Um, I know a lot of times we hear rates that seem incredibly low and they're really not there. They could be, and I'll kind of explain that in a second, but we're busier than we normally are because of course of a lot of refinances. A lot of people who have a rate anywhere higher than 4% should certainly be looking at a refinance today. Um, but we're also still very busy with purchase business. Hopefully you guys are seeing that there's still a lot of activity out there. You're still getting buyers that are wanting to go buy houses. That's not really slowing down. Uh, we are finding there are some borrowers who are furloughed, uh, they're getting pay cuts. Uh, we can still finance some of those borrowers, and I'll give you a couple of examples of that. Um, we don't expect rates to, to change a whole lot in the near future. Uh, we do expect them to stay where they are. We expect them to change very slightly. Uh, they probably um, will start going up at some point, but all of our projections show them staying low where they are for the next year or so which is good for all of us because that'll get more buyers off the fence um, and, and hopefully put more money in your pocket. Um, so the big one that Ryan mentioned to me this morning was about rates, where they are. How many of you have heard commercials or seen commercials with rates anywhere in the ones, like one point something or two or you know, right around two, right? 1.9 and 2.75. Yeah, so I'm looking at my pipeline right now, and the rates I have clients locked at today are between 2.625 and 4.625, okay? That's a big spread, right? Two points is a big spread. The, and I've locked a few clients in the past at two and a half. Those are 10 or 15 year mortgages, okay? 30 year mortgages, the lowest 30-year rate I've locked anybody at recently is 2.875. The reason that you see those rates is because those lenders are trying to get you to call them or get a consumer to call them. And when they start talking to that lender, they realize I could get that rate, but I'd have to pay two points, two or three points. Does everybody know what points are? Somebody tell me what a point is. Sends it alone. It's, it's a cost to buy down your interest rate, okay? Um, you hear a lot of commercials for lenders and they've been touting refinances for a long time. There's a lot of people on the radio that are saying, we'll pay all your closing costs, okay? Or no closing costs, no lender fees, okay? When we submit a loan to somebody, do you think that somebody has to work on that loan besides me? Anybody who's been through the loan process before knows that they've talked to the loan officer, they've talked to a processor, they may have not have talked to an underwriter, but they know an underwriter looks at their file. Then when they go into closing, someone has to work with the title company to get that loan closed. All of those people have to get paid. 
So there are lender fees on every loan because that's how lenders pay the people that work on the loans to get them done. What some people try to advertise is, well, we won't charge you lender fees. Okay, so how are they gonna pay their people to work on the loan? They're gonna give the consumer a higher rate. It might be an eighth higher, it might be a quarter higher, but that consumer is gonna have a higher payment for the life of that loan. What we do and what a lot of other lenders do is simply disclose up front. We have lender fees. We have to pay people to work on your loan. So we're gonna charge you $1,200, $1,400 as part of those closing costs. That way the consumer gets the lowest rate possible. Now, if they want a lower rate, I'll absolutely talk to them about buying down that rate. If I look at the, the what's called a par rate, which is the rate at which there's no cost to the consumer, it might be at 3%, three and an eighth, three and a quarter, somewhere in there. It all depends on many factors, but mostly credit score, how much they're putting down and what type of loan they're doing. Also what type of property they're buying. Those are the main factors that determine what an interest rate will be. Better credit score, more money down, primary residence, you're gonna get the best rate. Investment property, minimum down, not such a good credit score, you're gonna get the worst rate, okay? So if it's beneficial to the consumer, then we might charge that consumer that half a point or point to buy that rate down. One point is 1% of the loan amount. The average loan amount is about $250,000 in Central Florida for us. That's one point is how much? $2,500. Make sure everybody's awake doing math this morning. So if, if, it, if I'm gonna tell you, you gotta bring $2,500 more to closing, what sort of a benefit would you want out of that? What do you think would make sense for you in terms of a lower payment? $10 a month, $20 a month, $40 a month. There has to be a benefit, right? And if I charge that consumer that $2,500 and it only saves them $10 a month, how long does it take to pay that $2,500 back they took out of their pocket to buy that house? A really long time, <laughs> almost as long as they're gonna have that loan. And the reality is most people aren't in loans longer than three to five years. The average person that buys their first home moves within three to five years or calls me to refinance if they're gonna stay there because rates got better or they wanna to go to a 15 year instead of a 30 and pay it off faster. So there's all kinds of reasons why it doesn't make sense to pay those points, even though that rate sounds just super attractive, right? So when I tell you my rates are 2.625 to 4.625, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, the lowest rates are on the 15 year and the 10 year. The 30 years are still low. They're in the low threes. Most of my clients are locked at three and a half and lower. There's only a few outliers. Those are brokered loans, maybe a manufactured home. Um, maybe I have a construction loan I locked last year. Obviously we're gonna float that rate down when that house is done. So the bottom line is don't get too caught up in those low rates and understand that there is a cost to get something that good. But if we look at where rates are, who remembers rates in the teens? Who remembers rates at nine and 10%? I'm number 15. <laughs> my, my wife, the lovely Stephanie, used to be Langley, Ryan's beautiful sister. And I built our first home in Tallahassee in 1992 and our interest rate was nine and a half percent. Prior to that, they were much higher in the 80s. When I tell people I'm gonna give them a rate anywhere in the threes, you ought to be really, really happy. <laughs> that's, just, that's just really good uh, for anybody. So any questions regards to rates and that kind of information? Uh, hey, Tom, when we hear about the, uh, the Fed dropping rates or raising rates, why don't we see that in mortgages? Um, you do, but you see it's either already built in or it's delayed. And a couple of things about how that works. So the Fed monitors, uh, uh, controls monetary policy for the country. They learned a lot from the crash in 2006. Nobody in my industry that I listen to has any expectation that that's ever gonna happen again. Part of the reason for that is that the Fed is being smart about what they're doing with rates. The Fed rate, so when you hear the Fed drop the rate a quarter point and it went down to one and a half, that is not a consumer rate. That is a rate that's called a bank rate. 
That is the rate that Wells Fargo will loan money to Chase. Okay, bank to bank lending happens all the time. And that's what that Fed fund rate is. Now, when the rates are lowered, we already kind of know that's coming because the Fed has meetings and they announce what's going to happen. We already kind of know. So Wall Street builds that in. All of the factors that determine interest rates um, are, are factored into that decision, but we already know that ahead of time. Because of what the Fed has done, and they started doing this and dropping the rate three years ago, that's why rates are so low today. Because over time, there's a delay, but it does happen. Um, what people need to understand about what affects a mortgage rate, there's one thing, it's called the mortgage bond market. Does anybody put money into stocks or bonds? Anybody invest in the stock market? Okay, stocks are more volatile, but they yield better returns. Bonds are more stable, and they're longer term loans. So people literally buy mortgage bonds. So when you do mortgages, they get pooled with a bank and people can invest in that. Doesn't return 8%, 9%, but it returns money over time. When the mortgage bond market goes up, that's when rates go down. When the mortgage bond market goes down, that's when rates go up. There are many factors that affect the mortgage bond market. It's mostly things that happen in the economy here and over in Europe. But primarily, unless something happens and people are buying or selling mortgage bonds, rates are not going to change, unless it's something dramatic. Hey, Tom. Yeah. Uh, so I was just hey, actually, hey, how you doing, Tom? Um, good, good to meet you. <laughs> just reading an article actually this morning. Um, it was it was from June, but it was a uh, you know basically an article talking about the Federal Reserve is projecting they're going to buy mortgage-backed securities and bonds to the tune of, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars that they, right. the Fed chief has said that he is going to keep that going for the foreseeable future. So obviously right. that, from what you're saying, that's going to keep mortgage interest rates down. Um, Correct. And that, and the, so that's why I was thinking, like we're talking about, well, are we going to see, you know, a wave of foreclosures? And, and I'm thinking like, you know, I mean, nobody can predict the future, and that is a tricky business. But if yeah. things if things stabilize over time, and uh, with the forbearance, even with forbearance, you know, people are going to get back to work. Those, if, if I understand right, with forbearance, the the payments are kind of moved to the back end of the mortgage, so they, it's not like they're going to have to pay a ton of money uh, once they come out of forbearance. It's just that they're going to have the you know back end. That depends be, on the lender. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think with that, with interest rates projected to stay down, and like Brian pointed out, uh, homes are appreciating in value like crazy. So uh, that was not happening even in 08. Uh, right. Now forward, I saw homes just going down the tubes. And the other thing is, too, the, another point was made uh, was that because of the shutdown, people weren't spending money. And if they still had a job, they were saving money. So there could be a pool of cash being unleashed uh, once things kind of, we get past all this COVID stuff. And so right. all that kind of put together, do you feel like the that there will not be this wave of foreclosures and driving home prices down and everything? Yeah, we, the expectations that I'm seeing and the predictions are that it will nowhere be nowhere near what we saw before. Um, so regarding forbearance, I've seen letters from lenders that for clients that have said, hey, is this what I should be doing or not doing? Some of them are simply, hey, you don't have to make a payment for the next six months and we'll, we'll like you said, tack it onto the back end, which is the best for the consumer because a lot of the times I get a letter that says, well, we'll let you skip six months and your mortgage payment, let's say your mortgage payment is $1,500 a month, but at the end of that six months, you're going to have to make those six payments and give us nine grand which is ludicrous because the whole point of it is the person's not making as much money. They can't make those payments. You're asking them to not make a payment for you, but save enough money to make it up on the back end. So unfortunately there are some lenders out there that they don't help the consumer as much as we would like. Ryan made a good point. We're probably going to see more sales, but not short sales. People who just need to get out of it because they can't afford it, have to go live with family, whatever. Um, and the foreclosures will be there because of some of those reasons, some of those banks that are not reasonable. Um, but it's not going to be anything like what we saw before. It shouldn't be, at least. 
Um, hey, one thing to mention about the Fed, you mentioned uh, uh, buying mortgage-backed securities. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, most of you are probably familiar with that, with the government agencies that back mortgages, conventional loans. Um, they buy loans all the time. They also set fees um, for lenders. And they just last week, unfortunately, raised their GSE fee, which is a, it's a fee that's charged to the lender, every lender, half a point across the board. Mm. So Wednesday, they announced it. Thursday, everybody's rates, the cost for the rate, not the rates didn't go up half a point. It doesn't mean that a consumer I talked to on Tuesday and quoted a 3% rate is going to get a 3.5% rate. It's the cost for the rate. So if you guys ever look at a rate sheet, you'll see what I mentioned was a par rate. So it's a rate where there's no cost to the consumer. And then as you go up that rate chart, there's a credit I can give the borrower, which we do frequently. Or if you go down the rate chart, that's when you're buying the rate down. It's a cost for the rate. That just meant the cost for the rate went up half a point immediately. I priced yesterday, I talked to a refinance client. Her rate went up one eighth of a point because of that change, okay? Her payment difference on a $330,000 loan, anybody wanna guess what that payment difference was for that eighth of rate? Somebody give me a number. $8. $11 a month. Okay. Most people think it's 30, 40, 50 bucks a month. It's $11 a month. So it's a very small difference in payment when you're talking about eighths in rate. So people get all caught up in rate because it's a big thing and people tout it. It's not always the most important thing. Any other questions you have? Hey, Tom. Tom, I do have a question. Um, I saw that the the FHA, you know, they're adding that fee or whatever, you know, the additional fee. Is that going to be impacting the VA as well, loans? Currently, that's only affecting conventional loans. It's only done through uh, Fannie and Freddie. So it's not okay. affecting FHA or conventional or, or VA loans at this time. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Hey, John. I hate to chime in again, but I do have a question because uh, I've talked to Ryan about this. We've talked about it before because as as real estate agents uh, at a closing we're we're legally allowed to credit their commission and how do lenders look at that you know that i so i'm basically going to credit the buyer my buyer a certain amount of percentage of my uh, commission to help with closing costs. okay uh, how do you look at that okay so you can, three people can give the buyer a credit, the seller, the realtor, or the lender. Any of those credits are called interested party credits, okay? We always say seller credit because you guys have probably talked to plenty of lenders that said, hey, I got my buyer pre-approved, but he only has enough money for the down payment plus about $2,000 for closing costs. We need a $5,000 seller credit. You negotiate with the seller, you get the right price, you get the credit, everybody's happy. If the seller can't give that credit, you can give part of your commission. The only thing the lender needs is an, a letter from Carissa or Ryan that says, yes, they're allowed to give their commission. We're fine with them deducting that. Really easy. I can give a credit as the lender. I mentioned the rate sheet, the par rate, no cost to the consumer. If I go up, if I have a client that needs thousand dollars towards closing costs and you can't give up your commission because you're already given up some or it's just not a big loan or the seller won't budge on any credits i can do that i have to give the consumer a slightly higher rate but again if it's 10 or 11 dollars a month for an eighth in rate and i go up a quarter point and that consumer is only paying 20 dollars a month but i can give them a thousand dollar credit it's a win for the buyer every loan program has a limitation on what can be given so fha is six percent Conventional is three to nine, depending on loan to value. Um, VA kind of doesn't care, you <laughs> do as much as you want. Um, basically pay all the closing costs. So that has to factor into it. So if I'm doing a conventional 5% down loan, the seller, the lender, and the realtor can only give a max of 3% combined. So you can't exceed that number. Okay. So I need to so, check with you before I do that <laughs> with my buyer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's good to just ask ask the lender, hey, 
you know, where are we at? What do we need? You know, do we need to have a credit? And if it's from you, um, you know, that's fine. It, it works out as long as we do it. I've, I've done that. I've done combinations of all three, you know, uh, seller, lender, and realtor to make the deal work. So for example, a hundred thousand dollar mortgage for some loan programs, it can only be $3,000 total. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And obviously you don't want to do that because you know, it's all your commission. So, you know, if yeah, you did right, 1%, right. And I did 1% yeah. and the right. seller did 1%, then that might work out great. You know? Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, right. I have a question about, uh, uh, this is one of the topics actually, uh, supposed to be closing at the end of the month and now we are 19 and the loan is not coming out of, uh, uh underwriting yet. And every, okay. time, every time the loan officer, uh, I talk to the loan officer and they say that it's, it's not, you know, they're not, uh, they, they, they're back, they, they're back, they have a lot They're of, backed up in underwriting, yeah. So is there any reason for that? Yeah, there's a lot of reasons for that. And thanks for asking that. That was a, a question Ryan wanted me to cover today was um, turn time. We call it a turn time from the time we turn a file into underwriting till it comes out of underwriting. Um, First, let me explain the three different types of lenders that your borrowers can work with. Most of you already know this, but they could work with their bank. In my opinion, banks are really good at being banks, most of them. Um, I think smaller banks are better than bigger banks, but that's just my opinion. Um, there are brokers, and most people refer to us as mortgage brokers, regardless of what type of company we are. It's a little bit of a misnomer. A broker is someone who sends all of their loans out to a lender and they truly act as a middleman and they take the buyer's information, they try to pre-approve them. And then when it's time to do the loan, they have to send it to that lender to be underwritten and, and usually processed and everything's done out of their office. That's where you see the really long turn times most of the time. What we are is called a direct lender. So if you ever hear the term direct lender, that means that we can underwrite for the lenders that we put our loans with. Every, every company that originates loans, except for Wells Fargo and Chase and Bank of America, um, puts their loans with somebody else, right? If I do a loan for somebody, if it's a conventional loan, when that loan is closed, it's gonna get sold for the servicing, who they're gonna make their mortgage payment to, to bb and or Wells or Chase or somebody like that most of the time. There's other banks we use that are smaller banks you don't really know. Sometimes we keep them and we service them through a third party company. As a direct lender, the benefit that we have is that we process, underwrite, close and fund the loan at Waterstone Mortgage. My processor sits 20 feet away from me outside my office. My head underwriter is four offices down the hall. If I have a problem, if your loan, is your, you pronounce your name uh, Hervé or, or Herb? How do you pronounce your name? Hervé. Hervé. So if Herve, we have a loan of yours for your consumer and we're processing that loan and there's a problem and you're upset about the fact that it's taking a long time and you're not getting an answer, I can walk down the hall to the underwriter and say, hey, can you help me out here? We've been in underwriting for five days, six days, eight days, whatever. Um, that doesn't happen here, by the way, on purchase loans. Um, and I've got a person I can actually talk to that can get something done. Um, we do broker loans, but 97% of the loans I do are in-house loans. Our turn times for underwriting for purchases right now are still at 48 hours. They might roll to 72 when we get really busy, but throughout this summer, we have underwritten almost all of our purchase files within two to three days of being submitted. Broker loans are a different story. <laughs> I broker and Ryan knows that I do probably a dozen manufactured home loans a year. Um, they're not fun, but I'll do them because it's a loan and I want to help the consumer because that may be the only product that consumer can buy. I have to broker most of those. Some of them I can do in-house. Those are going to take longer. The last two I submitted to two different brokers, both of them took three weeks to underwrite the file. So if you are working with a mortgage broker, you are going to see those long turn times probably on every loan that you do with those brokers. If you have a relationship with a broker, you like the broker, you want to work with them, I'm not trying to talk you out of that, just kind of giving you the, the 411 on, on what's going on. Um, so that's 
kind of where we are on that. And that's why you're seeing those turn times. Now, refinances are different. We do prioritize purchase business. So some of my refis take a week, five, six days, seven days to underwrite. We build that into the process. We don't schedule refis for less than five weeks out. But we are still taking any contract you want to give me outside of a brokered loan. I'll take a 30 day or less contract any day. But hey, Tom, so yeah. but through all the refinances, and there's been a flood of refinances, obviously, with the, with the interest rates. Correct. Those are pulling down a lot of underwriters, right? They can be, yes. If the, if the lender is not prioritizing purchase business as we do, then if they're underwriting everything the same, then obviously the influx of refis. And guys, there's a lot of lenders out there that build their business on refis, right? I'm sure you've heard of Quicken Loans. They're kind of big deal, you know? Um, some of the local guys that advertise on the radio, just they're pushing refis all the time. That is not a sustainable model in the mortgage world. It is today. It will be for another year. But what's going to happen when rates go back up and they're at four and a half and 5%? How many people are going to need to refinance? Like nobody. So that's why we focus on purchase business. And that's why we turn them over as fast as we normally do. Um, Hervé, your, your, your deal could be a lot of reasons. It could be, I don't know who it's with, but it could be that um, they are just underwriting and they're just backlogged because they're busy like everybody else. It could be issues on the loan that the loan officer isn't sharing with you. Um, one of the things I've always done, and I learned this when I bought my first house, when I moved here, um, I had a terrible experience. Uh, I wasn't in the mortgage industry. I went to buy a house. They told me I needed a certain amount of money for closing. It was a nightmare from the start. When I got to the closing table, because back then you bring your checkbook, right? It was a lot more money than they told me and I didn't have it. And I remember that to this day. So when loans go sideways, if there's something I didn't anticipate, if there's a problem on the loan, I'm gonna call you and tell you right away. And a good lender should do that. A good lender should call you and tell you, hey, I'm really sorry it's taken so long in underwriting, but here's what's going on. Um, I have a loan right now that I'm trying to get finished that a loan officer left our company. It's a manufactured home brokered loan. It's a mess. And I've been trying to get it closed for two weeks. Every day I call the realtors and let them know what we've done to try to fix what was wrong with it, what we're doing to try to get it closed. If you guys would say a little prayer for me, I think it's going to get cleared today. <laughs> I'm hoping. But those are the things that you really want to hear. You want to know what's going on. If I called you Hervé, a week ago and said, hey, man, I'm really sorry, but I know I'm not going to get this file out of underwriting for another week to 10 days. You would feel a lot better knowing that up front rather than at the last minute, hey, man, I'm sorry, we're not out yet. We're not out yet. We're not out yet, right? I mean, I, we try to anticipate as best we can what's going to happen. And a good lender is going to call you with a problem and give you a solution. And that solution might be, look, I just can't get this done. Here's why but I've got it handled, it's gonna get done, but I need a week extension, right? And if I call you and I call the listing agent and tell them that, most people are happy to do that, right? Because we all want the loan to close. Nobody wins if the loan doesn't close, right? Buyer doesn't win, seller doesn't win, realtors don't win, I don't win. So that's how it should work. Yeah, yeah I guess uh, Ryan sent the, your information if I don't get any good answer from that book, I can contact you and see if I can uh, give you that. Role. Yeah, please. Please feel free to call me anytime, guys. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. If I can help get it done there and give you a reason why, that's fine. If, if you need to switch it, I, that happens frequently, unfortunately. Um, again, a lot of times people who start working with banks, uh, banks are very conservative by nature. So there's a lot of loans they just can't do. Um, also something to understand about how loan officers get paid. Um, we get paid straight commission, just like you guys, right? We don't make any money if the loan doesn't close. You don't make any money if the house doesn't sell, okay? Um, people who work for other companies, more, most likely banks, I'm not trying to bash the banks. I'm just trying to, again, give you information. They're paid a small salary and they get a small amount of money on that loan. The incentive for me to close your loan is much higher than somebody working at that organization. It's just, it's just a fact. I'm not saying there aren't good people there. You may have relationships with somebody who works somewhere that you think is awesome and they do a great job for you. And there are people who are good that work there. Um, but in general, you, you want somebody that's got a very vested interest in getting that deal done. 
Yeah, Tom, you don't you don't have to bash the big banks. I do that on here every week, and I give them that exact. <laughs> um, not not to get too much into Tom's business, but I can I can tell you, uh, and I don't want Tom to, have to tell you this, but uh, a a person uh, a loan officer typically not the big banks, but typically typically gets paid about half of what you do on a deal. So they want to see it done or less badly as you did. Yeah, but 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 a significant amount of thousands of dollars. So they want to see it get done like you do. Um, and when you, these big banks, I hear you guys all the time. I'm the one you just call to cry to when Wells Fargo doesn't close your loan or Chase doesn't close your loan or somebody's not returning your calls and they let your, your client lose their deposit at the last minute because they didn't get it done. And, you know, they're going to lose a hundred dollars their check next Friday and you lost a deal and possibly a client if you lost their deposit. So just, yeah. just keep that in mind. I got a question. Hi, Tom, and I, I think Ryan, you may want to uh, speak on this too as well. So somebody made a great point yesterday. Because the market's so active, there's low inventory. There's a lot, a lot of buyers out there. So a lot of these homes are getting multiple offers, uh, you know, and going and going over list price. And the point was made that as some realtors or buyers are going to juice up their offer, they're going, look, we'll have a quick closing. Uh, you know, my, my, my buyer is pre-qualified. We're going to have a quick closing and you should take our offer because we're going to get it closed quicker. And of course, the point was made is that that's almost impossible. And so like, uh, you know, when we're working with buyers or, or if you have a listing and you're looking at multiple offers for your home seller is just because somebody says, look, I'm going to offer the same price everybody else is, but we're going to close this loan in two weeks or whatever. Um, is that, should be skeptical of making that kind of offer. And of course, Ryan's talked about uh, in contracts on the time frame uh, for for uh, loan commitments and things like that. So I was just wondering both of your opinion on that. Uh, I'll, let, I'll let, let Tom speak on this because there is some value to that. And there is some truth to closing a loan faster than other people can. Um, I, I would say on the, on the, seller's side on the listing side, I would be wary of it, of course, because we've all been there. And then what happens, you're going to close it in 20 days. And then on the 19th day, you get the, oh my gosh, we need an extension. We're stuck in underwriting, right? So you get that a lot, but there are some lenders who move faster than others and that can make your offer more attractive. Um, and so that's, a, this is where you guys need to know the difference in the lenders too. It's not just for your clients when they're, when they're borrowing, but also when you're representing uh, a sale and you see who their pre-approval is from because you know the motivation of the other side. So, uh, but I'll let Tom answer that. I know uh, Tom has, for you guys who don't know, Tom did a, uh, gosh, Tom, what was it last November or something? He did a uh, presentation for us uh, at the downtown office back when we could all see each other in person. And he went through a calendar of a, of a closing and he went through a, a 30 day process with us. And he, uh, he let us know he can close most loans, I wanna say 20 something days, um, 21 days or something like that. And yeah. so I'll let him speak on that. But he also, you know, he mentioned in that, and, and I've always felt, so if you can use that for anything that you can do in an advantage in a seller's market like this to help your clients offer, aside from just going up on the price. And we've talked about that too from the, from the listing side. Somebody just keeps going up on the price. Well, what good is that if the appraisal, you know what it's gonna appraise for. And they can offer right. dollars and they're gonna come back to you and, ask you to bring it down. So, um, so, you know, I'll, I'm gonna let Tom speak on this, but it's what you said, there is some merit to closing it quicker, but uh, I'll let Tom speak on this and what, and what he can, can do and what he has seen, but pay attention to not just from the pre-approval, but pay, read the pre-approval, see who it actually comes from. And this is why you need to know the difference in, in banks and brokers and, and, and direct lenders. Yeah. Um, as I said before, there's a difference in the lenders um, and really you're, you're not going to get a fast closing from a bank or a broker most of the time. Okay. And there's outliers. Um, there's um, and there's reasons for that. And most of it has to do with, as I explained, we have everybody in our office. The system is more efficient. Um, I think that closing calendar, Ryan, that you mentioned is on my website. Um, it's just, it's real easy. It's tomwiner.com. Um, but there should be a closing calendar on there that kind of lays that out. I will tell you the key to closing in three weeks is the buyer. 
if that buyer does not get me every document I request the day I request it or the day after, if they don't e-sign their loan in 24 hours after we send it, if they don't respond to my processor when it comes out of underwriting with conditions within a reasonable time frame, it will not close in a short time period. So that's where you and I have to have a really good conversation with the buyer and be on the same page to say, hey, you wanted to close this in 31 days to get 21 days to get your offer accepted. This is what you got to do. And I'm very honest with people about what it's going to take to do that. Um, but most brokers can't do that. As I mentioned, the brokers I work with now, the last two I submitted took three weeks to underwrite. You're not closing in three weeks if the whole underwriting takes three weeks. It takes me two days to get it to them or a day to get it to them. Then it comes out, you know, you know all the things that have to happen with that. Um, most banks can't do that. Banks are conservative by nature. Banks are slow. Um, I'll let Ryan speak to their, your experience with online lenders. Um, I, I know most realtors I talk to don't want to see offers from online lenders. They're big. They're out there. They're just, they're big. They're too big, in my opinion. That's part of the reason why. We're not the only ones that can do that. As I mentioned, we're a direct lender. I don't mind mentioning competition, mortgage firm, FBC. If you have a listing and you're getting offers from those companies, they most likely can close faster like we can. They have systems built up like we do. They're direct lenders. That, that's what you want. You want to ask whether the lender is a direct lender or correspondent lender, other than a broker. There is a very big difference, and that's really the only reason why we can make things work that way. What's a, what's Tom, a safe gonna... thing to put on a contract then, would you say, Tom? If I'm writing a buyer, you know, contract for a buyer on a home, what would be safe to put on there for the time frame for loan commitment, you know, things like that? I mean, a standard, you know, conventional FHA, VA loan, 21 days. If it's, you know, if I tell you the borrower's clean, I don't have issues. You know, we have to have that conversation ahead of time to be able to say that. But that's that's kind of the, the fastest. We've done them faster. Most of the ones that we've closed faster have been rescues from other lenders where literally everything is handed to us on the first day. Here's a full package. This thing fell apart. That lender screwed it up. Here's everything. We've closed those in a week to 10 days when we can transfer the appraisal and not order a new one. But if I'm starting from scratch, it's real hard to do it less than 21 days. But that's the shortest I'd ever want anybody to write a contract. And that's, again, got to be a special circumstance and we've got to have that conversation. Hey, Tom, do you have any lenders that, that you have a line of credit through, like Warehouse Line? For commercial lending or? No, for residential, to where you can close in Waterstone's name. We close all the loans in Waterstone's name. I don't know if you were on the call from the beginning, but every okay, loan that sorry, we right, close I, here. I joined late, sorry. No, that's okay. Love your graphic, by the way. Um, we, um, we're a direct lender. So I broker about two to 3% of the loans I do, but most of them are processed, underwritten, closed and funded in-house. Then the servicing is sold. Okay, cool, thanks. Yeah. Hey Tom, uh, this is Eric Bagel here. I have a question about FHA loan. So, so what's the benefit of using an FHA loan compared to conventional loan? I know a lot of people go into an FHA. FHA, okay. So there's a couple big differences. FHA has always been the standard first-time home buyer loan program, primarily because it's three and a half percent down. Um, I actually have a broker that does a two percent grant behind that. I think it's been suspended now that we're in COVID, but it'll probably come back. So buyers can literally buy a house for one and a half percent down. Um, plus the debt to income ratio is higher on FHA. So most first-time home buyers don't make as much money, don't necessarily have as much money. And that's why we try to use FHA for them. Also, if the credit score is a little bit lower and typically under 700, FHA will give that buyer a better payment than a conventional loan. Um, the drawback is that the mortgage insurance, everybody's familiar with mortgage insurance or PMI. If you don't put 20% down on a conventional loan, um, you have mortgage insurance. All FHA loans have mortgage insurance. In 2000, gosh, it's already been seven years, I think. In 2013, FHA said you no longer can drop mortgage insurance. So an FHA buyer will have that PMI on their loan for the life of that loan until they refinance it or sell the house. 
the good thing is that with conventional kind of, if some of you that are closer to my age may remember, and it wasn't necessarily me, but even my parents buying houses, you had to put 20% down. You didn't have these options 50, 60 years ago. When conventional decided to let people put less down, you can put down as little as 3% now. And we have some special programs for first responders. They can only put down 1% on a conventional loan. Um, they'll still have PMI, but they'll be able to drop it. So those are usually the comparisons I give people. And I mentioned that debt to income ratio. Um, FHAs is more liberal, meaning someone can have a little bit less money, make a little bit less money and still qualify for the house they want because I can qualify them at a higher, their debt load at a higher percentage of their income. It's basically what a DTI is if you're not familiar with that term. I think you say something interesting to me. You say you cannot drop the PMI at all for FHA? Correct. You can never drop it. You have to literally refinance the loan or when you sell the house, do another loan. And for the conventional, it, dro it drops automatically, right? When you hit the 20%. Yeah. Be careful of that though. So here's what really happens. So it's at, you're right. It's when you have 20% equity or you're at 80% loan to value. So let's say we have a conventional buyer that's putting 5% down and they pay their loan for the next three and a half years. It's about what it takes at 5% down with the appreciation we see in central Florida. Um, Ryan, you guys think it's two or 3% a year still appreciation roughly. It's about what we see normally in, in home values with you paying the loan down, loan down normally, you're going to get there in about three and a half years. When you get there, the lender is not going to automatically drop it. And the reason for that is the lender does not take into account appreciation of the home. If you buy the home at 200, and you put $10,000 down and you get down to uh, that 160 number, which is your 80% loan to value, the lender still thinks your house is worth 200 and they're only going to automatically drop it when it gets to that 80% based on the purchase price. That takes a really, really long time. Most of you probably know a 30 year loan, you don't pay it down very fast. You don't pay more principal than interest on a conventional loan until the year 22 way down the road compared to a 15 year mortgage where you're paying more principal and interest than day one, on day one. So when you go to, when you get to that point and what I tell the consumer is um, I do annual reviews. So the second or third year I'm talking to that client, I'm going to say, Hey, where's your loan balance? Let's look at Zillow, which I know is not the end all be all of value, but it's the only thing I got unless I call Ryan or, or somebody else. Or I tell them, Hey, call your realtor and find out what your house is worth today. Okay. I want to I'll try to put them back in touch with you too, because obviously, you know, you want them to buy another house with you someday. They have to petition the lender to drop the PMI. They simply reach out and say, Hey, I bought my house at 200. It's now worth 210, 215. My loan's down to 163. I'm at 80%. I'm at 79% loan to value. That lender will either say, okay, because they have their own model of value. And some of them, the last time I did it, they just dropped it. They didn't have to do an appraisal. A lot of times you have to do an appraisal, but it's worth it for the consumer to spend 450 bucks on another appraisal to determine, yeah, the value's there, the gap is there. Immediately at the next payment, the, lender, the buyer doesn't have to pay that anymore. Okay. Thank you very much. Just one last question and I'll let everybody ask. Yeah. Uh, so if, if you have a 30 year mortgage, but you don't want to refinance, so you have a great rate and you know, you're not going to get the rate again, and you, can you pay more like almost like a 15 year uh, mortgage, would that be the same thing? It's gonna get you close depending on the rate. So the comparison I do with a lot of people right now, most people that are refinancing now are dropping their interest rate a point to two points, okay? When you're doing that on a 30 year, it makes a huge difference in your payment. And some people want that because they want a lower payment, right? It just, this is what I need right now, I just need a better payment. Other people want to pay the loan off faster. So they go from a 30 to a 15, which drops the rate even more. The comparison I give them is what they're going to save over the life of that loan. So I just compared for somebody doing a 15 year mortgage compared to the loan they took out five years ago. That's a 30 year. They would save hundred thousand dollars in interest over the next 15 years. Okay. You won't get that same result if you keep your 30 year mortgage but add the four or $500 difference in payment. That's what you're talking about doing, right? Paying extra mm -hmm. towards principal. Yeah. You'll get close, but you may not get the same result 
if you're not getting a lower rate. Like you said, if you already have a very good interest rate, let's say somebody did a loan, uh, we, were, we were at these rates five or six years ago, and you're, you're, it doesn't make any sense for you to refi. If you're at three, three and a quarter, unless you're going to 15, it makes no sense. Um, I can actually run an amortization table, and a lot of people can, can find that on their own, to tell you if you want to pay it off in the next 10 years, I can tell you exactly how much extra to pay towards principal. Most loans don't have prepayment penalties. That's the only thing you have to look at. Um, in 2000, the last loan I did with a prepayment penalty was pre-crash, so 2005. Um, and those were for, you know, really low score borrowers, um, just kind of niche loans that had a two-year prepay or a three-year prepay. The vast majority of loans don't have prepayment penalties. You can pay $200 extra a month. You can pay $500. You can drop $6,000 at one time if you want. Directly reduces your principal, pays it off faster, but does not change your payment. All right. Thank you very much. Answer your question? You're welcome, man. Thank you. Hey, Tom. Uh, Victoria had a question, and um, she hers was more of a, I, I guess, she, she's been here since the beginning, but she had a question about what can she expect uh, for rates right now? What, what is a reasonable thing? And you went through this a little bit earlier, but what was a reasonable thing she can expect for a rate right now for a, for a 30 year rate? Can I ask her 19 questions to find out what her rate's going to be? <laughs> She's on here. You can if you want. <laughs> Literally, we, we sat down one day and figured out there are actually 19 different factors that determine an interest rate. But the main ones are what type of property you're buying, uh, single family home, condo, um, what, uh, whether it's going to be primary residence, second home, investment property, uh, how much you're putting down and what loan program you're doing, and the magic number, what's your credit score. Um, who knows what the minimum credit score I could currently give somebody a loan? What, what's the lowest score I can do today for a, uh, a loan? 580. Give me some guesses. What's that? Maybe 580. Pre-COVID, I could go down to 500. I don't want to, but I could. It's right now at 620. Um, people call me all the time and say, I don't have an 800 credit score. I don't think I can buy a house. You can buy a house with a 620 credit score or higher. Now, somebody who has a 620 credit score versus somebody who has a 720 credit score is going to get a much higher rate. Um, I mentioned in the beginning of the call on my pipeline right now, I have rates from 2.625 all the way to 4.625. Okay. That is a range of 15 year primary residence purchase or refis. 10-year refis, as I start going up in rate, uh, somebody with a lower credit score buying a house at 95%, maybe it's a condo. Um, actually, most of the rates are not over. I only have two in the fours. The highest rate I have above that is 3.625. The one in the fours is my nightmare broker manufactured home. And the other one is a construction loan that was locked a year ago. Um, that's going to float down um, when he's finished with his house in about three weeks. So the, the answer is I can't give you a specific rate, but if you're looking at 30 year, it should be between three and three and a half. If you're looking at 15 year, it should be between two and a half and three. And, and again, that's, that's the best I can do just because there's so many factors that go into it. Yeah. I, that's without paying a lot of points. That's the, that's the key there. You know, a lot of, um, I've had buyers ask, so what's the mortgage rate now? How's the market? And so I always struggle to give them an answer because there's just so many things that I'm not qualified to say. And I feel like that's a mortgage right. in position. But then I also yeah. think it discourages the person from looking at my credibility as a realtor. Yeah. You should know this as a realtor. And so I'm like, oh man, sure. okay. Yeah. <laughs> so what I would do to be real, what would be really safe for you guys to say and really easy is if you want a 30 year mortgage, rates are currently between three and three and a half percent. If you want a 15 year, they're between two and a half and three. That's a really easy way to give them a number. And, and again, when they see, well, why can't I get a one and a half percent rate? Because I see that advertised on the radio. You kind of touched on that in the beginning. Those are teaser rates that lenders are throwing out there online or on a radio advertisement just to get people to call them. That rate does not exist without that consumer paying multiple points to buy that rate down. So a real rate at minimal cost are the ranges I just gave you. Uh, one more question. Sorry, Ryan. No problem. <laughs> um, no, that's as many as you want. 
Um, where, what is a website that you can um, find out where is the market right now? Like just a general overview without calling the mortgage. Um, we probably, I probably have that. They just redid our websites and I'm sorry, I haven't looked at it as much as I should, <laughs> but there's probably, um, there's a lot of information on my website, uh, tomweiner.com again, real easy to find. Um, we probably have things on there. The problem is most people just go search mortgage rates and they go to bank rate or they go to lending tree or something like that. And that's where you see those ridiculous rates. You guys should actually do that. And you should click on the lenders and put in a scenario and see how many points it takes to get that 1.9 rate. Because that's what people don't do is they don't click all the way through and they don't realize that that rate only exists at a very high cost. Sometimes that's worth it to the consumer. Sometimes it's not. Okay. Thank you. All right, yep. Tom, I have a question. Um, one of our agents, uh, Tammy, uh, we gave her a diamond award and now she's off celebrating with a pedicure and she can't ask this question on her phone. So I'm going to ask. Her. <laughs> well, good for uh, her. Congratulations to her. She wants to know if you, uh, if you're doing no down payment loans for medical doctors. We have a, we have several options. Yes, I do have, I think right now we have about 700% loan options outside of VA and USDA. We have, uh, we're backed by a bank, by the way, Waterstone Mortgage. We're based in Pewaukee, Wisconsin. We're backed by Waterstone Bank. So we have bank portfolio products. Um, people that are less than four years out of bankruptcy, we can do loans to the bank. Um, there's a lot of good products there. There's a 100% loan um, available through the bank. Um, and we have a 1% down for first responders. Um, but to your point, yes, we have, we have two new, two different doctor programs and one of them is a hundred percent. Awesome. Um, somebody asked a question about uh, building and, and, and cost to, to lock a rate. Um, we do construction loans. Um, actually just so I don't give you a litany of what I can do. The only thing I cannot finance is a lot. And, and again, we're strictly residential. I can't do anything commercial, but I can finance everything else. I have a resource for that somewhere. It may not be pretty depending on what it is, but we can do it. Um, construction loans, we typically lock for nine months to a year. Um, it generally costs between a point and a point and a half. Um, it just depends on the time frame. Um, it depends on how big the house is, how long it's gonna take to build. Um, the one I have that's supposed to be done next month was actually supposed to be done three months ago. It took three months. Ryan, is Lake County always slow with permits? Uh, I think I thought every county was, but maybe. It, it took him three months to get the permits from Lake County back in the fall. So it was just, it got delayed really far. But, but there's a float down option. Obviously, when we have a rate environment like this, I locked my client last year when rates were much higher. So, um, but it's, it's usually a point to a point and a half for a construction loan to lock a rate that far out. Um, and then you're protected... Somebody now doing a construction loans in great shape because rates are likely to be higher or the same a year from now, as opposed to my client who's you know coming off what we had to lock at four and a half, um, but we'll float that down. Uh, he'll be he may have to pay a little bit to do that, but he'll get a closer to market rate when his home is built and we modify to the permanent financing. Well, construction loan time, Mr. Eric. Uh, when is the first payment due? I'm always curious about that. Is it due? I mean, you gotta need some money to start building the house, right? So when is the first payment due uh, for, uh, for construction loan? Is it after the house is built you move in or when you get the loan? Um, both. So when you do a construction loan, ours is called a single close construction loan. Um, the There are some lenders who do two time closes, which means you close up front, you close when it's done. We close up front. As long as the house is done in a year, we don't have to requalify the borrower. So literally nine months later, your situation could be completely different. We don't care. We've pre we have approved you up front based on that information. When the construction loan closes, uh, you start paying interest on the draws. So if you're not familiar with the construction loan, let's say somebody buys a lot for 200,000 and they're building a house for 300,000. So their total acquisition cost is 500,000. Um, the initial draw, if the borrower financed the lot, is 200,000 plus what the contractor needs to get started. So when that loan closes up front, 
there's an amount that the builder gets to start building the house. That's called a draw. The borrower pays interest only on that draw amount. So if the first draw is 250,000 interest only payment on 250,000 at three and a half percent would be $729 a month. The next month they finish part of the house, they take another $20,000 draw, payment goes up a few bucks. Every month it's gonna go up a little bit as the uh, builder keeps taking draws to finish the house. Then once the house is finished, it modifies to the permanent financing and now you pay your mortgage, fully amortized mortgage payment plus your escrow and PMI if it's available. We can do we can do construction loans up to a million at 95% financing. Very good. So when you first get a lot, so does a lot and the builder have to be at the same, uh, same package or you can get them separate? Two, two different ways to do that. That's a great question. So the one that's almost done that I did last year, um, he financed the lot a couple of months before we closed the construction loan because that contractor there are contractors who will acquire the lot for you as part of the contract, and there are contractors that will not. If the contractor doesn't want to do that, then you just have to go finance the lot yourself. Uh, local banks, Ryan can give you some. There's a couple of the smaller banks in, in Claremont, Ryan, you know, that's where Brian did his. Um, they'll finance the lot. That lot loan gets paid off when we do our construction loan. If the contractor is willing to roll the lot in, I'm about to, I'm about to close one in another uh, two months where the contractor is gonna acquire the lot for um, the, the buyer. And so they'll build it into the contract. You know, $300,000 to build, 200,000, you owe the contractor 500. It's not paying off the bank 200 and paying the contractor 300. Make sense? Yes, and then again, the, the initial draw is still gonna be based on paying off the lot and some money to start building. Is that, is that a different in, in, in rates uh, if the lot is owned by an LLC or uh, individual? Yeah, we cannot close loans in the name of an LLC. That's a great question. If, the, if there's a lot that's owned in the LLC and, and that's going to be paid off, the new construction loan will have to be done in the consumer's name. There's nothing stopping us from moving some, um, somebody moving a property into an LLC after it closes, but Lenders cannot close in the name yeah. of an LLC. Does anybody know why? Mm. They have an idea why? What, what action does the bank take if you don't pay your mortgage? Foreclosure. Can you foreclose on an LLC? No, you can't, you can't go after that consumer because they're protected by that LLC. And that is why banks will not loan money other than, um, you know, portfolio type loans where a bank is willing to take that risk as are very few and far between. Uh, we can close in the name of trust though. Um, that's a big difference that people don't know. So people can protect their properties by moving them into trust and LLCs. Uh, they just can't close it in the name of the LLC. Tom, um, we have a question from Don about first time home buyers. Uh, any yes. programs you might have. And I wanted to, uh, before you answer that, I wanted to talk um, about that 1% for first responders, um, who all qualifies for that. And I think that uh, you guys really pay attention to that. That's kind of a, a big deal. Yeah, it's, it's uh, nurses, uh, firefighters, uh, police, anybody that works in any of those professions, teachers. I do find that most of the people that I pre-approve for a loan, that's not necessarily the best loan product for them. Um, while it's a great option, do you guys think the interest rate and the cost might be higher for a 1% down loan as opposed to a 5% down loan? Yes, yeah, yeah. the answer is yes. Any, uh, any loan, like, yeah, Tom, I, bond I, programs? I want them to, I want them to uh, but it's a good way to get a conversation going though. And it's a good way Absolutely. to Absolutely. Yeah, and, thank you. I was, I was... And a lot of our people, um, like John is trying to do a program right now, and a lot of our people are doing programs where they are, are giving incentives to people that they are, you know, hometown hero type things. And so that would probably come up against the, and I wanted to ask you about that, come, would that come up against the, um, 
the limits that we talked about earlier of what you can give them back um, if they did decide to do the 1%. But even if they don't decide to do the 1%, what a great marketing strategy that is to get first responders. A great point, that, yeah. I mean, everybody's excited about that. Then they let them talk to Tom and Tom will say, yeah, and this, this, this. And they're like, okay, that's okay. But, but if you put 5% down, we can do this and this and this, and then they're going to be excited. So um, I want to do, I want to talk point. to you about that, let you go on about, and then, and then hit Don's question about first time home buyers. Yeah, uh, that all ties together. So the, um, the advantage of having a lot of products is not that I'm going to put people in all those products. I mentioned that I have seven different hundred percent loans. I only do VA and USDA. I don't do any of the other ones. I've not done one yet. We've had a program through the bank. It's called the Wealth Builder Loan. It is 100% financing. It's a seven-year arm, and it's a 20-year amortization. That means the payment's higher. That means the rate's only fixed for seven years. We targeted it to millennials, thinking there's a lot of millennials out there, my, my oldest son included, who don't have kids yet, don't have a ton of expenses unless they have student loans. They really haven't had time to save money though because they're just starting their careers. So 100% loan is great. They're, most of them are making decent money where they can afford a slightly higher payment because of the higher amortization. I've never put anyone in that loan, but I've marketed that loan and gotten clients that were better suited for other products. That's the same thing about that 1% down first responder loan or a doctor loan or anything else is that it gets somebody to my doorstep that I can talk to and I can tell them that, yes, this is a program and I'll give you a comparison. Every client I pre-approve, I don't just say, hey, here's an FHA loan option. What do you think? I'll compare FHA and conventional. I'll compare um, the 1% the, the down loan with a 3% down conventional or 3 or 5% so people can realize it doesn't make a lot of sense to put more money down if you don't have to. So it is a great way for you to market. And actually how I've used that 1% uh, first responder loan, another realtor and I um, marketed to firefighters. Um, and her son just became a police officer. So we're going to start marketing to them. Literally go to the firehouse, drop flyers, and say, here's a loan program that might be good for you. Most of those firefighters that buy a home are not gonna use that program because they're gonna get a better option and a better payment with something else, but it's a, it's a conversation starter. That's what you guys really need to have in, in real estate as I do in mortgages. You need to have those conversation pieces that you can talk to people about. Um, the the first-time home buyer programs, it's kind of a, it's a funny thing. People think that there's just this one or two magical programs that are only available for first-time home buyers. Um, I mentioned before when you were asking about FHA loans that <clears throat> that's the typical first-time home buyer program. And the only reason is that is because of the features of the loan. Um, but there are specific programs that you only can get when you're a first-time home buyer program. The most common is Florida Bond. You guys familiar with Florida Bond? Florida Bond offers $7,500 to $15,000 as a silent second mortgage. There's no payment on that, but it helps them with that down payment. And that actually allows us to finance over 100%. I can do a 5% bond program behind a 97% first mortgage, and that buyer is actually financing 102%, which means some of that money goes towards closing costs which means we don't have to go to the seller and say, hey, can we bump the price and have you pay three grand toward closing costs? Saves the buyer money by keeping the house down, makes negotiations easier. So the, the short answer is yes, we have several first time home buyer programs. Um, what I do is a very comprehensive conversation with the client. I wanna determine if they have zero funds, I wanna make sure there's no options to get funds from somewhere else before I put them in that program. Do you think that Florida bond by giving somebody a $15,000 bond loan to help them, do you think they're going to charge more fees and a higher rate on their loan? The answer is yes. So it's not always the best option. I always tell people there's no free money, right? <laughs> it is money. They're giving you money to help you buy the house. Some of those you actually have to pay them back. I'm refinancing a client right now that bought his house three years ago with a $15,000 bond. He has to pay back 6,000 of that in the refinance. 
Now, he's still saving a lot of money because his rate's dropping two points. So it isn't that big a deal. But people need to understand that I want to have the conversation with the client to make sure that I'm going to give them the best option, whether it's Florida bond, whether it's the portfolio 100% loan, whether it's a three and a half down FHA with a 2% grant or a standard 3% conventional. I'm going to figure out the best options for that borrower and then we're going to let them decide which one suits them best. All this information. So, on is yeah. All, all the, is this information on your website? Uh, yeah, the vast majority of it, you'll be able to see loan programs. Um, if you can't find something you need there, call me, email me. I'm happy to talk to you guys about it. I have a question for Ryan and for um, you as well. So if we have a customer that is buying a property with a Florida bond program, is that something that we have to disclose in the contract, in the financing? Or is the Florida bond program just like a regular FHA or conventional or USDA or it doesn't matter? Is that something that the we first mortgage traditional terms? Yeah, the first mortgage is going to be a traditional conventional or FHA loan. So you'd still write, I'd still write your pre-approval letter with that. Um, you can disclose it. It's not, I don't know, Ryan, you could, you'd have to tell me if you guys are bound to disclose. I don't think you are. Um, that there's a bond program, but we just, my pre-approval letter, if I'm doing a 97% first with a $7,500 bond behind it, it's going to be a 97% down conventional loan pre-approval letter. Okay. And the second question is, are those Florida bond programs required any approvals from the county sort of thing? Just like, because I closed uh, a home last year and the lady received the, the down payment assistance from the county and we had to actually get, she had to be approved to do that, not just by the lender, but by the county. Is the Florida bond program in the same situation? The, the consumer will almost always have to do a home buyer education course. They can do them online now. They're pretty easy to do. Um, and yes, the, the Florida bond and some of the other programs we work with, that's just the most common one that, that I use. Um, they, they look at the file as well. They have to, they don't necessarily underwrite it like we do, but they're taking a look at it. And they're making sure the buyer meets the qualifications. It, okay. And there are income limits. <laughs> I saw, I'm sorry. I saw somebody else ask the question about an income limit. There are income limits on all, almost all of those programs. Um, and, and sometimes it has to be a first time home buyer. Sometimes it does not, uh, like the 97% uh, conventional loan, uh, Fannie and Freddie are different. One requires a, a home buyer class, one requires to be a first time home buyer, one does not. Actually, they both require first time home buyer classes. I'm sorry. So, again, each program is a little bit different, but in general, yeah, there are income limits on those, just like USDA. If you guys aren't familiar with that, that's a really good option. I've been talking to a lot more clients about um, it, has an income limit and a geographic restriction. If you're not familiar with USDA, um, back years ago, Lake County used to be all of Lake County. Now, like none of it, like these little small pieces, you got to go out. Um, you got to go down to St. Cloud. You got to go out past UCF. You got to go, there's little pockets of like winter garden in some areas east, uh, or west. Uh, you got to go out past Oviedo, but there are spots up in Volusia County, a lot of places where people can US, use USDA. It's a hundred percent loan program that as long as they're under the income limit, I've had clients that bring no money to closing. They can get their closing costs paid and, and it's a great program. So and I'll use that sometimes instead of a bond program, because if, if I can do a loan that's hundred percent financing and they can get their closing costs paid, why would I want to do a Florida bond loan? That's going to give them a higher interest rate, pay a point more in fees and have to pay that bond back if they refinance the house or sell it within the first five years. So there's, there's, you always have to look at everybody's scenario and, and find out the best program for the buyer. Hey, Tom, uh, this is Eric. I have a question about student loans. A lot of buyers have student loans, 100000 or more. What's the best way to, try to mitigate that and try to get them a loan? So a few years ago, we did not have to count a student loan payment in the client's debt to income ratio if there was not a payment listed on the credit report. That changed about two or three years ago we now have to count some sort of payment for every client. 
every loan program is a little bit different. If they are in forbearance, then we have to calculate the payment, again, depending on the loan program, as either 1% of the balance or get a document from the lender that tells me what their payment is going to be when they start paying it back. Um, if they are on an income-based repayment, some loan programs, let me use that. Does everybody know what income-based repayment is on a student loan? It's basically the, the consumer going to the, the student loan company and saying, hey, I really can't make these payments on this student loan. Can you reduce my payment? They look at what they make and they drop their payment down to a very small amount. It's not paying the loan back. They're, they're, unfortunately, when people do that, they're, they're not getting ahead on that loan, but it's a temporary thing. If they can get an income-based repayment that says their payment is zero, there are people who have student loans that don't make enough money, I can actually use that on some loan programs, but not others. So it's, it's all, they're all very different, but we usually just, again, we try to find the best solution. If, if the 1% is the best option, then that's the loan program that borrower is gonna be qualified for. Is that 1% of the loan? Yeah, so if they own $10,000 on a student loan, I gotta count $100 in, this, in their payment. Uh, as a payment in their debt to income ratio. And if they haven't started paying yet, so you have to reach out to the lender, that's what you say? Yeah, so if, if that default works, so if I'm pre-approving a borrower to buy at a certain price and I have four student loans on their credit report and I put in 1% of the balance for a payment and they're still qualified to buy that house, we're done. We don't have to do anything. If I need a better payment, I had somebody the other day with $70,000 in student loans She's not a doctor, she's not anybody else, but she's got a lot of student loans, <laughs> like a lot of people. And she can't handle a $700 a month payment if I use 1%. If she reaches out to them and says, I wanna pay my student, loan back, student loans back over 20 years, can you give me a, it's called a fully amortizing payment. That's what your mortgage payment is, that's what your car payments are, they're paid in a finite period of time. If they get me that payment over 20 years, her payment will go down to about 450. So that's a lot easier for her to absorb in her debt to income ratio. So Thank it just depends on the borrower and, and what we need. You're welcome. That's very good info. Appreciate that. Yeah, you got it. Any other questions for Tom? And you guys have his website. So I put his website over here on the in the chat. Um, he is on our vendor list on your paperless pipeline under the reference tab. Um, and Tom, you can do loans throughout the state. Is that correct? I can do loans in 48 states. I can't do loans in Hawaii and New York. Unfortunately, I'd love to go to Hawaii for a closing, but I can't. Um, yeah, and we're, we're anywhere in the state. You guys probably aren't going outside the state a whole lot, but yeah, we, we're in about 21 states as a company and we can lend, like I said, in, in, in 48. So anywhere in the central Florida and, and all around Florida, if you need help, um, happy to do it. Okay, um, well, thank you. We, we have a lot of people in uh, Tampa and uh, Ocala and, and uh, we just yeah. uh, recently joined the boards in St. Augustine, St. John's and Jacksonville. And for you guys who are on this call right now, you're the first ones to know we just uh, got an address for an office in Jacksonville. So nice. we're going to be growing up there as well. So when you guys need agents, we have a handful of agents up there already. And we're going to start growing there like we did in Tampa five years ago where we now have 200 agents. So um, great too. And we're also, um, we recently joined the Citrus County Board. Um, we're joining the Hernando County Board this week. So we will now have every bit of area covered from Jacksonville to Sarasota and uh, all places in between. Um, and we're also members of the Miami board if anybody wants to do anything down there. So we're growing like crazy. Uh, I want to thank Tom for being here today. Tom has a, a, a bad back. He injured his back and he was going to go to the chiropractor. I called him this morning, like I told you, to fill in. And he has been a trooper and he has gone an hour and 20 minutes. And I really, really appreciate it, Tom. Um, and uh, you, guys, to help, the man. information Tom gave you today you, do you guys think this is important to know what you can offer your clients it is incredible. Some of this, I didn't know a lot of the stuff that he said today about some of the programs they have. They're always changing. They're always adding. Um, you've got to stay on top of this and, uh, and, and offer things that I had no idea about 1% this and and hundred percent that. And the, uh, I mean, I've known about the bonds, but guys, you've got to be able to use this stuff to attract clients. And then when you and let 
Tom, talk to them just like you do when you attract them and then you might get them off on something else, but you got to get the clients and they're willing to have the conversation. Um, and clients, not everybody has to have great credit. Not everybody, you know, a lot of people that do our leasing program, they end up turning those people into buyers because the people thought that their credit score wasn't good enough and they thought they didn't have enough money. And then they educate them on a hundred percent financing and they educate them on, on, um, uh, loans from the government, you know, they are, uh, bonds and, 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 uh, I want to say grants, stuff like that. So, uh, I really appreciate Tom being here. You've been a trooper, man. I really appreciate it. And you've been a great source of information. Um, if you guys ever need anything, he's your guy, um, have them on your team. When you meet with those home buyers and they got to get somebody on the phone, have them call Tom, get them pre-qualified, get them pre, pre-approved. Okay. So Tom, thank you very much for coming. Um, we love you. And uh, to all of you guys, have a great day. If you need anything, let us know. Once my back gets better, I'll be sure and carry you next time we play golf, okay? I appreciate that. <laughs> I thank you. That. All thank right, you. Bye. bye, everybody. Thank bye, you. Guys. Bye. Bye.